We'd like to warmly uh, welcome everybody to the funeral services for our brother Steve Bernson. Uh, I am Tyler Inslee. I've, I've had the pleasure of serving as Steve's bishop for the last few years, and uh, he's a good friend. Um, we want to thank uh, those who, uh, who have traveled distances to be here. We appreciate uh, all of your attendance uh, in supporting the family. Uh, we want to thank Andrew, uh, funeral director with Anderson and Sons, for taking good care of Steve and the family as well. Uh, we want to thank Sister Wood and Sister McCann for, uh, for helping us with the music today. We will start with hymn number 98, I Need Thee Every Hour, followed by which uh, Sister Gwen Davis will give us our invocation. Thank you. 
the example he has been to us through our lives. And we're so grateful for our brothers who are eager after our death best on. We're so grateful for the gospel and the knowledge that we have that we will see him again. We hope that we can live by his example because he really was a giant of a man in spirit and the body and everybody's best friend. You do anything for anyone. Please let us learn from his example. Let him know how much we love and adore him and we're going to miss him so much. And we know that they had a great reunion on the other side with his older brother he hasn't seen since 1969. We are grateful for the gospel again and for our testimonies. And please let us keep Steve in our mind. We love him very much and we're going to miss him. We're grateful for all the many blessings that we have. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sister Davis. Uh, the, the program will go as follows. We'll, uh, we'll be a pleasure to hear first from Brother John Burdett, who will be reading the obituary. Um, and then it will be our pleasure to hear from each of Steve's children. We'll start with Stephen Burnson Hall, and then we'll uh, hear from Colin Burnson, followed by which will a musical number uh, that will be sung by Breck and Keel and Nate Vogel. And then our two concluding speakers uh, from the family will be Sage Birdson and then Kate Birdson. Brother Burdett. I'm going to start off just by honoring Steve. <clears throat> He became my best friend over the last year. I know it was a short period of time. But we talked every day, almost every day, unless he was with his kids. Um, and every night, almost. So once or twice a day, we'd laugh and talk about things and cry. Uh, had a lot of special experiences. But he's my eternal friend. Eternal. Help it with Steve Fred. Um, if you noticed on my neck here, I've got Steve's glasses. He bought me. If you tell Steve something you like, he buys it for you. So honestly, he bought me like a, a weed sprayer. He bought me um, a salt gun to shoot flies. But I'm going to use these. I'm going to use these things as spiritual tools. Um, when I think of spraying weeds, I'm going to rid sin from my life. And as I um, use that salt rifle, I'm going to use it to get rid of tedious, stupid things in my life that are a waste of time. And as I look through these glasses, I'll focus on the things that are closer to me, family, friends, and neighbors. Now, I'd wear these glasses today, but he got me the wrong string. <laughs> so if I look at my paper here, it's blurry. <clears throat> but I love Steve. I love him with all my heart. Um, I'm going to read the obituary here. If I could clear my eyes out. Hold on, sorry. Stephen Roy Burnson passed away peacefully at the age of 57, surrounded by loved ones at Lakeview Hospital in Bountiful, Utah. He died on Monday, February 7, 2022, after valiantly fighting against COVID-19. Steve was born in Bountiful, Utah on January 8, 
1965 to James, otherwise referred to as Big Jim, and Rhea Burnson. Steve, more affectionately referred to as Bernie, was loved by all, known for his caring demeanor, legendary bear hugs, and infectious personality. From an age, Steve had a passion for sports, which he continued throughout his life. He played baseball and football, and with his talent, he became an all-state athlete in football. Believe me, I tried to mess around with him one time, and he, with his uh, lineman stance, it was kind of scary. <laughs> Steve also took his love of sports to the sidelines serving as a mascot for Bountiful Braves his senior year in high school. This is a job he took very seriously and was widely known to be the best at it. Steve had five children that he loved dearly. <clears throat> he never failed to show up as the biggest cheerleader he made it a point to impress upon his children that they were never an inconvenience to him. He would travel long distances to watch their games, pick them up when they were sick or homesick, or just to be there when they needed to know that they were loved. He was always willing to drop everything to help his kids. On numerous occasions, he drove trailers full of his kids' stuff to aid them in moving across the country. I remember this specifically because I wanted to go with him. He found also, or he also found out that of the utmost importance to provide his children with memorable experiences. On several occasions, he spontaneously surprised his kids with a trip to Disneyland. Steve was a proud grandfather of four, with another one on the way. His oldest granddaughter, Oakley, decided to carry on the nickname Bernie in place of Grandpa. His grandsons loved going on four-wheel rides to find reindeer or go on camping trips and going to the arcade with him. Bernie will be remembered for his great heart and never-ending sense of adventure. Steve was a lifelong member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He served a full-time mission in Chicago, Illinois. He graduated with a bachelor's in accounting from Utah Valley University, where he also received his teaching degree. He was a jack of many trades, an entrepreneur, a tradesman, a home renovation expert, and a high school accounting teacher, among, among many other skills. As a child, Steve is remembered by his mother as always taking things apart just to see how they worked and subsequently putting them back together, succeeding most of the time. <laughs> Steve is survived by his mother, Rhea Bernson, his daughter, Stephen Bernson Hall, her husband, Sean, and their son, Hendrix, and Tina Hemphill, Stephen's mother. His son, Kate Bernson, his wife, Taylor, their daughters, Oakley and Indy, and their son Riggins, his son Colin Burnson and his wife Emily, his daughter Brecken Kill, and her husband Gavin, his daughter Sage Burnson, and their mother Lisa Burnson, his sister Gwen Davis and her husband Steve, his sister Sharon Mitchell and her husband Dave, his sister Kathy McNamara, I'm sorry, Kathy McNamara and her husband Steve his brother Mike Burns and his wife Jenny, and an abundant and loving extended family. He is preceded in death by his father, Jim Burnson, and brother Kevin Burnson. Steve will be missed by many longtime friends, family, and anyone who has ever been touched by his larger-than-life personality. Next to his Savior, Jesus Christ, and his family, his true love was driving his boat on Lake Powell, Surrounded by loved ones with a big smile on his face. We know that's how he would want to be remembered. 
with that big smile on his face. Um, I just want to say I love you, Steve. I know you're here, and I know you love your family. And I say these things in Jesus Christ, amen.
So, yeah, it's hard to follow up on that, all right? Um, there was this one day when I was 16 years old. I'm not sure on the particulars, but I was a disgruntled mess. I decided to go on a drive. Maybe I was bitter, maybe I was lonely, maybe I felt the world was trying to conspire against me. There was a freshly fallen coat of snow on the ground. In my angst, I wanted to test the limits of my car and see if I could go off-roading a little bit. I made it about 20 feet, and my car was stuck. I tried to get out and push it myself. No movement on the car. I tried to get out and dig snow out of under the tires. Still no movement. I didn't know what I was going to do, but there was one thing that I had not tried yet. That was calling my dad. As soon as I asked him for help, he came right up. By this point, the sun had already set. He got his truck and hooked the tow rope to my car and pulled me right out. Though my dad could have been upset with my choice to try driving a car through a snow field, <laughs> instead, he saw that I was upset, and he gave me a hug, and he comforted me. That was my dad. He was there for me. Though not a dire situation, he showed up. That was him, always showing up. He never would dream of missing any of our sporting events. When I needed him to help Emily and I move across the country, 1,800 miles, he got in the car and he did it, no questions asked. On several occasions, he drove over 1,800 miles again for no other reason than just to be with us and spend time with us. When he arrived, he would see needs and he would just fill it. Our, our fridge uh, water filter was over six months expired. He just bought us one. Once he sensed it cold, he just bought us a humidifier, top of the line, the best one we could get. I know Johnny can attest to that. He just bought the best stuff for us. He saw that our cookware was borderline dangerous to use. <laughs> and so he bought us new cookware. He saw a need, and he just did it. Quick side note on that, don't tell her I said this, but Emily cooking was always dangerous. <laughs> and my dad would agree. <laughs> there was a palpable generosity anytime you're around my dad. To know him was to know his big heart. I wish I could thank him right now for always showing up. I'm heartbroken that when I now call him to rescue me, as Stephen said, he will not physically be able to do so. It's hard to realize how much you need someone until they're actually gone. But I know that while his mission here in this life is over, his eternal mission continues on. He will be continuing the work of showing up just on the other side. He will continue to be there. The day my dad left this mortal life, I wrote an Instagram post, and though I thought long and hard how I could articulate my grief, I really couldn't come up with it. So I'm going to read it again. There are those in life that establish themselves as a pivotal piece of your foundation. For me, this is my dad. Today marked the end of his mortal sojourn after a battle with COVID-19. While I'll miss him tremendously, his influence will not be forgotten. He is not physically meant me, but his unconditional love will continue on. My dad always taught me to find the transcendent in the ordinary. Today, the enabling power of the grace of Jesus Christ is that transcendence. In him, my dad will find rest and peace. I am grief-stricken for the loss of a best friend and a dad. But my question is, what is grief? but the perseverance of love. Though I'll continue to feel immense grief at the loss of my father, I know that that grief is nothing more than the power of enduring love. My father's love will continue to sustain me, and I will not forget it. I know 
that there is no finality to death. Life and death, indeed, is not empty. It is the garden tomb that is empty. I know that I'll see my dad again, and he'll be there with open arms, like he always has been. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> Reckon, aka Steve's favorite child. <laughs> I really am though. <laughs> my dad always encouraged me to sing. One of my last memories of him was on New Year's Eve this year. We sat around a campfire and he just listened for hours as I sang and played the guitar. Today I'm just going to imagine just sitting around that fire singing to my dad one last time. I love you dad. Trust 
I did not know I was going after the song. <laughs> I specifically put myself second, so I'm confused before the song. But it was a really beautiful break. 21 years ago, the youngest person child was born. Me. <laughs> now, there are three things that really set me apart from my siblings. First, I was the only child that my dad had no idea what gender I was until the day I was born. My mom and brothers found out that I was a girl, but they kept it a secret from my dad, because that was his wishes. <coughs> However, he convinced himself that I was a boy. So, in the delivery room, when he found out he was wrong, he literally jumped up and down and ecstatically proclaimed, I have another little girl. And then he bawled like a baby, kind of like me. <laughs> Um, second, I was named on the I was named after the street I was born on, Sage Drive. And third, the nurse, the nurse who checked me out oh, as a newborn gave me a perfect ten. Something she said she had never given to another baby. Speaking of ten, I want to tell you my top ten of, my, of dad. One, we traveled a lot as a family in my childhood. Dad ingrained in us the importance of the Sabbath day even while on vacation. Yes, we were that family who would dress up and go to church and even buy a cooler the day before for Sunday. Two, there's nobody who gives better hugs than my dad. He's a gigantic teddy bear. Three, we shared the love for the great outdoors. Well, Lake Powell is my dad, dad's favorite place on earth and it will always be my favorite too. It will always hold a special place in my heart. We have also recently spent a week in Hana, Hawaii, and we both share a love for the ocean. We spent hours in the waves together and never got bored. Four, I've known as Sassy Sage, and Dad and I had many disagreements. However, he'd always come back to me when he was in the wrong and try and mend things. Because my relationship, his relationship with me, meant more than him being angry. Five, Dad was always really generous with money and also in other ways. I will always remember when our neighbor was out of town and their dog passed away in a sad accident. Dad preserved the dog in the freezer until they were, <laughs> until they got home so that they could have a proper burial. <laughs> My mom was beside herself when she looked in the freezer. She wouldn't have been as generous. <laughs> Six, strong. He, it, strong is an understatement for Dad. He went single-handedly carried a ping-pong table to our neighbor's house for the Jensen's. <laughs> um, this was no small feat. However, the last time we rigged foot wrestled, I won, and I have a video to prove it. <laughs> Seven, even though on the exterior, Dad was a big, tough guy, on the interior, he was a big softy. There was rarely a moment in church, a church service, where he didn't have tears in his eyes. He felt the spirit so intensely. He recently walked my sister down the aisle with tears in his eyes. While he won't physically be here for mine to do this for me. I know he will be right beside me the whole way down. Eight. It was important for my dad to sit down with us on a regular basis and have a priesthood, personal priesthood interview. I'm sorry, I can't see through my tears right now. Okay. Or as we like to call it, a PPI. It was. It always began with a prayer. Then he asked how we were, and saw what we could do to help us and to make our lives easier. He was always such a good listener and gave the best advice. My dad, nine. My dad taught me to work hard and to stick with it until the job was done. This, especially in sports, as many of you know, I play volleyball at the University of Charleston. And my dad was recently able to attend some of my games. I will miss looking out to the stands while I'm on the court and seeing him. And we'd always do our special sign. His philosophy after about a bad game was to take the good with the bad and the bad with the good. Ted, I recently got some advice to me from dad. He said, you must fight for the things that are worth any significance in life. 
Also, this is a mixture of both joy and heartache. Dad, you were right. Life is a mixture of both joy and heartache. While my heart is smashed into a million pieces right now because I miss you so much. I am also joyful in the belief that you helped and guided me. Relationships continue after death and family can be forever. Thank you for teaching me how to love and give. I'm so grateful to call you dad for the 21 years we've had together. I know you'll be in the stands for every game. And I have good news, you won't have to wear a mask this time. <laughs> And Dad, this one's for you. Have I told you today? I love you and love you. Say these things in a new disguise, Amen. Well, I chose to go last. I don't know why I did that. My, uh, sorry, I don't have my notes up. Um, I just wanted to second what Stefan said about the outpouring of love that we've had through, especially the last three weeks. Um, love and support and all that, we've just been amazed. My dad taught me many things. Um, one thing was to always be prepared. And you might think, I learned that from the Boy Scouts, but my dad taught me to repair it in a different way. My dad and I shared a love of mountain biking, and I'll never forget the story about when my dad was in the middle of the trail and he had to do some business. And so he goes off the trail and he comes back without a sock. <laughs> and we're like, Dad, Dad, and he's like, forgot some wipes, and from that day on, I, my dad has never forgot wipes on a bike ride. I've always been prepared for that. <laughs> he, taught, he taught us great sayings, like, I'm gonna go take a kid and why am I calling? <laughs> uh, mean what you say, uh, mean what you say, not what you, no, sorry. What you mean what you say. Mean what you, <laughs> mean what you say, say what you mean. Mean what you say, say what you mean. Uh, that was great. He was a great coach. Um, he taught me how to play football, how to golf, um, how to beat people at 21 in our pool, the basketball game. Those were so pretty intense games. Um, like I said, we found our love for mountain biking together. But most of all, he taught me about the Savior and his gospel. What is the doctrine of Christ? I'd like to highlight uh, what the doctrine of Christ is and how my dad exemplified it to me. First is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. My dad had great faith in our Savior. That faith sprouted from reading the scriptures, specifically the Book of Mormon. There isn't a day that I can remember where we did not read as a family. I know that this daily study gave us all that seed of faith and it helped it continue to grow. Second is repentance. A lot of times we think of repentance as a bad thing. Uh, but repentance simply means to change, no matter the size of that change or how long it takes. Like all of us, my dad was not perfect and he made a lot of mistakes. But he was always quick to ask for forgiveness and always quick to forgive. The third is baptism and making covenants with God. A lot of times we think of repentance as a bad, uh, sorry, <laughs> when we are baptized, and go to the temple, you make covenants with God. Partaking of the sacrament and attending the temple regularly helps us recommit and remind us of those covenants. I have so many memories of my parents attending the temple regularly, especially when I was little, it felt like they were never going to come back. <laughs> but uh, that, it was always a great example to me, and my, my wife and I have been able to do the same. Fourth is the gift of the Holy Ghost. As you gain faith in Christ, as you exercise that faith to repentance and when you make those covenants, we are promised to have the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a companion to guide you throughout life. My dad used this gift and taught me to rely on it. 
I remember when I was 13, I had a big struggle in my life. And I went to my dad. And I know he relied on the Holy Ghost to tell me what I needed to hear at that time. That helped me and helped me change the trajectory of my life at that time. These four principles are not a one and done thing, though. You have to continue to do them every single day. And that's what we call endure to the end. And my dad is endured to the end. When uh, last night, my sweet, my sweet seven-year-old uncle, we were talking about Bernie, and she said, "Does does Bernie have superpowers now in heaven?" <laughs> and I love that. And I believe he does. I believe he does have the powers to be able to help us, to be able to um, strengthen us and help us throughout. Uh, this, this hard time, but then also other hard things that are going to happen to us in life. These four principles, or five principles with endure to the end, could not be possible without our Savior, Jesus Christ. And that has been abundantly clear for my siblings, our dad loved his Savior. Because of his sacrifice, we will see our Father again. Because of his sacrifice, we can heal from this grief and hurt we have. Because of his sacrifice, we have peace right now. And that doesn't make any sense to me. How can I hurt this bad, but have peace? And it's because of our Savior. I testify that our Savior suffered for our sins, that he is the true healer, and then as we come to him with the, his doctrine and we present our hearts to him, he can heal us and make us whole. I know that I will see my dad again. I know that he will be with us. I love you, dad. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Riggins wants to say something. <laughs> when we asked him what he loves about Bernie, he said that he's really fun and funny and that he's in heaven now. So. This has been a sweet morning, brothers and sisters. Um, what to be part of, uh, of uh, Mike Burns and his brother, I've seen his, bro seen his brother's family prayer. It was so eloquently delivered. It's beautiful. And to be able to hear from each of his children, uh, really special, both uh, testimonies and in, and in song. Um, boy, Brecken and Nate, can I book you for my funeral? That was amazing. That was absolutely amazing. Um, but I can't, uh, I can't imagine how proud he is of, of, each, of uh, each of his children. Um, I'm sure you've each given him many, many moments over the years uh, for him to be proud of you, but I can't imagine he's uh, any more proud than he is right now for you coming together, strengthening each other, and, and remembering uh, the wonderful man that your father was. Uh, you know, the gospel is, uh, is amazing, right? But it doesn't a lot of times become really, really real until you lose somebody close to you. Um, the gospel becomes uh, very real really quickly when you lose someone close to you. Um, to have the knowledge that we have and to be able to understand the plan of salvation and what happens after this life is such a blessing. Uh, we know that Steve's in the spirit world now. And we know that uh, he can continue on uh, with his, uh, his, his eternal progression, which is a beautiful thing. Uh, we know one time that we're all going to join him at one time. Kind of crazy to think of, but we'll, we'll all be there at one point. We'll join him, and we'll be able to be reunited with uh, the other loved ones that we've lost. You know, he's free from the effects of his mortal body, which uh, I think for a lot of us will be a, a blessing at some point. Um, but we know that that's temporary. It's just a temporary uh, separation, as we know that we'll all be resurrected and that we'll be uh, redeemed from our physical life. 
Um, I, uh, I'm not really sad for Steve. You know, he's in a beautiful place. He's with, uh, with some of the loved ones that he's lost. Um, it's just tough to be left behind, right? And, uh, but knowing where he is, that it really doesn't make it any easier. Um, I feel President Nelson uh, said it best when he actually talked about uh, the subject of death. death. He said this. He said, we can't fully appreciate joyful reunions later without having tearful separations now. The only way to take sorrow out of death is to take love out of this life. That's why it's so tough, because we love Steve. Uh, and we'll uh, ever be grateful for, for knowing him. Um, I knew Steve for the last four years, not anywhere near as long as, uh, as probably most of you have known him. Um, but I have a lot of awesome memories, and they were all related to love. Just want to go through a few, and then we'll wrap up. Um, he was our Sunday school president, and I, uh, oh, I've sat in a, over 50 board councils with Steve, and so we got to know him pretty well. Um, he did a phenomenal job leading the teaching uh, in our ward, and, and was passionate about making sure that, uh, uh, that the teaching went well. I remember in COVID, him, uh, you know, him sitting in his big red truck, truck conducting a meeting when he had a hall on the weekend, and uh, he always showed up, even if he wasn't physically here. Uh, it was pretty special. Uh, last year, Steve, uh, Steve took some time off, uh, probably about a half day or so, willingly brought up his side-by-side -side to a, a youth camp that we had, and, uh, and took uh, a lot of the youth on rides, and he, he loved it and, and loved serving in that type of capacity. It's all about love. Um, it was just fun to hear Sage talk about her games. I remember cheering for Sage, sitting next to Steve at one of her games when she was here at Westlake. And his 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 chant, his uh, he had the loudest chant. It was it was really loud. I almost had to scoot, scoot a little bit away from him, but but he was so proud of uh, of Sage and of all of you for all the events that he uh, he attended over the years. Uh, that was out of love. Um, he attended Trek with us several years ago, and he was part of uh, kind of the equipment and cooking committee. And he just uh, just loved being up there and and serving. Uh, had an awesome attitude. He cooked an amazing cobbler uh, that was absolutely amazing. Anybody would have been proud of it. Um, but lastly, I'm grateful for Steve's testimony, for the love that he had for his family, and for staying true and faithful to the gospel throughout his life. That's uh, it's, it's extremely special. Um, brothers and sisters, it's my prayer that, uh, uh, that Steve's family will continue to have the Holy Ghost with them to comfort and guide them. <coughs> And it's special to hear, Kate, that you, uh, that you do have peace. Um, each of you can continue to have peace as, uh, as you understand and, and know where he's at and understand the plan of salvation. Uh, I pray, brothers and sisters, that we can live our lives every single day to the best of our ability, that we can live up to our covenants, uh, that we can do all that we can to be reunited with those that we have lost and with Steve one day uh, in a, gl a glorious reunion. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll, uh, we'll now, have, now have our closing hymn, number 100, Near My God to Thee, followed by which Sister Kathy McNamara will give us our closing prayer. All of us kids are going to try and attempt to sing the first two verses alone, and then we would love everyone to join in on the third verse. So I'll kind of conduct you all in.
Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we could be here today to celebrate Steve's life and the, the things that he was able to accomplish while he was here. We ask that that will bless family and friends as we mourn his passing, that we might be able to look forward to seeing to him again and to realize that the plan of salvation is important and crucial in our lives. Help us to enjoy the rest of this day and to reminisce and to remember the impact that he's had with us. And we say this in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Sister McNamara. Um, thank you for being your brothers and sisters. Uh, the pallbearers for Steve today will be Kate Burnson, Mike Burnson, Eddie Snow, Sean Hall, Colin Burnson, Benson Alder, Stu Christensen, and Gavin Keel. We'd invite you to head up these uh, west doors to help out uh, here in just a second. Actually, I'm sorry, go ahead and go right now. So the, the graveside service, brothers and sisters, will be at 1 p.m. Here, here shortly at the uh, Highland Cemetery. So if you're uh, going to be participating in that, it probably makes sense to just head, head right away after this. Uh, after, after the graveside service, there's going to be a luncheon right back here in the gym, this same building, at 2 p.m. Uh, all rise, go to the sisters.